Good morning. I hope everyone had a great first day of the conference, and I'd like to welcome you to day two. We have a full day of sessions ahead, and in addition to all the wonderful sessions, the exhibit hall officially opens this morning as well. In the exhibit hall, don't forget to check out the new demonstration stage. The stage is in the exhibit hall on, in the grand ballroom. You can check out the schedule for the day of all the demonstrations on the conference website. Uh, it's in the exhibitor guide as well as posted outside each of the entrances to uh, both exhibit halls. The welcome reception last night was wonderful. It was so great to see everyone out having a great time. <laughs> Tonight we also have some more fun in store. Uh, come join us, play some bingo. There's some great prizes, food and beverages will also be served. So we'll hope to see you there. This morning is the first of our featured presentations this week. Uh, Jared Smith, who is the Associate Director of WebAIM, will discuss the WebAIM Million Project and the user surveys data and how to use them to inform uh, your inclusion efforts. So Jared, thank you for being with us this morning. Good morning. Um, it's great to be here. I, it's nice to see the, the CSUN faithful up so early this morning. I um, want to send uh, my regards to uh, my friend, our friend, uh, Mike Pasiello, and just uh, wish him the very best and uh, let him know that we, I think I speak for all of us when I say that we miss him and are looking forward to having him back next year. Um, so yeah, I'm Jared Smith from WebAIM, which is the Web Accessibility and Mind Project. We're based at the Institute for Disability Research, Policy, and Practice at Utah State University. And we function as a, a consultancy out of the university. And we're passionate about web accessibility. We help people, uh, individuals and organizations, uh, make more accessible web experiences for those with disabilities. So I'll be talking about some research that we have done at uh, WebAIM. Um, that hopefully might be helpful to you in your inclusion efforts. So um, I think it's safe to say that there is a shortage of good and available web accessibility data. Um, you know, there are a lot of studies, of course there's research going on, but sometimes it's hard to find it and a lot of it's behind uh, paywalls. Um, but we need and uh, our decision should be driven by good web accessibility data. And that was one of the motivations for our research is just knowing that there was not a lot of this research that was readily available. Of course, when it comes to uh, data, you may have heard the quote, you know, if we have data, let's look at data. And I'll, if all we have is opinion, let's go with mine, right? Because we all have our opinions about how things should work. And um, let's certainly go with our own opinions if uh, in the absence of data. Um, you know, there's also this uh, Dilbert comic where Dilbert uh, you know, has this large dollar figure on the whiteboard and he says, I didn't have any accurate numbers, so I just made up this one. And he says, studies have shown that accurate numbers aren't any more useful than the ones you make up. And someone asked him, well, how many studies showed that? And he says, 87, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, we, I think in the accessibility field, we should realize that we often don't know the answers to important questions. Um, you know, we have accessibility guidelines and requirements uh, uh, that, you know, frankly, may be based on opinion, my opinion, somebody's opinion, or anecdotal uh, data and experiences, and perhaps not really solid data. And, you know, even at WebAIM, with, with our experience, we found that we would very often say things, and you, you may have, have caught yourself saying things like this. Um, we'd say things like, well, you know, screen reader users prefer this, or screen reader users use this. And, you know, we would say that based on our, on our own experience, um, but is that really a, a safe statement to say generally about that population? Um, <clears throat> we'd also say things like, oh yeah, you know, that thing, that's one of the most common accessibility issues found on the web. And maybe that, again, was our experience and the things that we had seen, but did not have really good data to back that up. So those were some of the drivers for the research that we have conducted. 
So I, I'm going to talk first um, about the WebAIM million analysis. So this is accessibility testing conducted on one million, well, the top one million home pages. Now, the word top, I mean, we use a few different sources to uh, determine it. You know, it turns out there's a, the, the web is really, really big, right? Our, the point of our research was not to find the top websites, it was to collect accessibility data on a very large number of websites. And that's uh, research that we've now conducted for four years. Uh, we just are actually in the process of um, analyzing our data for this year, and you'll be the very first to see some of uh, the initial results from uh, this year's analysis. So our accessibility uh, test data was collected using the WAVE um, API. Uh, the WAVE uh, testing engine analyzes you know, the fully rendered web page. We're not just looking at source code, we're looking at the rendered web page, the DOM of the web page after it's rendered, and JavaScript and CSS has been applied to it using a, a standard Chrome browser. So hope, you know, the intent is that it gives a better representation of the end user experience. Um, <clears throat> Some people ask us, you know, why, why just home pages? We know from research we've done that the accessibility of a home page gives a pretty good indication of the accessibility of the rest of the website. It's not a not a, a, a perfect proxy, but uh, it does approximate and at least provide some something useful about the accessibility of the web generally. Uh, we did in uh, 2020. We did do an analysis of 100,000 interior pages on some of the most uh, most popular websites, we found there was, was close alignment in the overall accessibility of interior pages with the home pages, but a little higher variability in the types and numbers of errors once you get into content pages. <coughs> we also collect site uh, technology data. Uh, we analyze up to 1,200 different tech web technologies that might be in use and we can then correlate and align the accessibility data with technology usage on websites. So things like jQuery or WordPress or advertising, things like that. And I'll show some, some of those data later. <coughs> uh, we also collect site category information. So you know, what are kind of metadata? What are the categories of these websites to see if there are maybe certain areas or categories of the web um, that are performing uh, differently when it comes to accessibility. So we now have a, a very large database, about three billion points of data, I think, uh, overall in our, in our database. Um, and there's way more there than we've been able to analyze. So, um, so a little bit of a summary, again, you're getting the sneak peek of this. No, nobody but me has ever seen these numbers yet. So a little bit about what we've found uh, for this year. This presentation will be a little bit of a combination of this year's plus previous years. So I've, I've not yet fully uh, analyzed all of the data. So this year uh, we detected 50,829,406 errors across those 1 million home pages. So an average of about 50.8 detectable errors per page. Uh, when we looked at the number of page elements, that means about one in 18 home page elements has a detectable error. So a, a page element will be you know, a paragraph, the, the page itself, links, buttons, a section of you know, styled or say bold text, uh, things like that. So uh, consider that you know, somebody with a disability on average, about one in every 18 elements um, on an average home page could present some barrier to that user. 96.8% of the pages that we analyzed had a detectable WCAG 2 failure. Now this is only um, detectable errors, right? This is not all all WCAG errors, um, all accessibility errors or uh, issues. So we know from that that the actual you know, conformance rate to those guidelines is really very, very low. Um, now when we talk about errors, those are things that using automated testing align with uh, guideline failures and with end user accessibility barriers with a very high level of reliability. So as we looked at the, um, so I, you know, I think if we think of our own, our own efforts generally, I think that's a, the, an initial place to start is maybe depressing as it might be is that there are, there are a lot of issues out there, right? It's quite pervasive on the web uh, in accessibility. As we look historically over time, we have seen a slight decrease in the number of detectable errors 
on average across uh, these pages over time. It is a kind of a, a slow, slow decrease, but uh, we have seen a decrease in errors per page, which is, I think is, is wonderful. When we look at WCAG conformance rates, um, you know, it's a very, very slow decline, like 1% um, over the last four years. So, you know, I don't, I hate to map out that trajectory, but you know, we're on, we're on course to have like a fully conformant web in like 400 years, right? Um, so uh, this is certainly of concern. Um, you know, with all of this said, um, while that conformance rate is very low, 22% of the pages that we analyzed had five or fewer errors. So almost a quarter of them had very few errors and 30% had 10 or fewer errors. And so kind of what that means is, you know, if we can address just a, a few issues on uh, quite a few sites, that conformance rate would, uh, would improve significantly. Another item that we look at is we do collect the number of web page elements. And this is one that for me is uh, quite alarming. The rate of increase in complexity or density uh, weight of home pages. It's increasing about 8% per year. And we're nearly, well, this year we were at 955 page elements on the average home page. Um, which means in our analysis, you know, our, our tools looked at and tested nearly 1 billion uh, web page elements this year. So that's a really notable increase. And I think if we look at the, at the previous graph of the conformance rate decreasing very slowly and the complexity of home pages increasing significantly, I think th I, I would suspect that there is a correlation here. It's hard to keep up with accessibility when the web is just exploding in its complexity and, and size. Not just the web, the home pages are, are increasing uh, in size that, that quickly. So, you know, I, I think it feels to me like if we could get a hold of this a little bit, and, and let, you know, it, it just wrangle in the web a little bit when it comes to size and complexity and, uh, you know, somehow instill that, that idea that more is not always better. It feels to me like we would really start to see some increases in improvements of accessibility. Um, we just need to keep up with, <laughs> with, you know, keep up and slow down the rate of growth of web pages generally. As we start to look at the types of uh, issues that are out there and errors that are most common, uh, this is the percentage of pages with the most common errors. 84% of pages analyzed had instances of low contrast text. 55% had instances of images missing alternative text. 50% had empty links, which would be a link that a user could navigate to, but there would be no useful information or content conveyed uh, to, say, a screen reader user for that link. 46%, so about half of pages had uh, instances of inputs that were missing labels, so text that was not associated to inputs to provide a, a description of the functionality of those inputs. 27% of home pages had empty buttons and 22% had missing uh, document language. So one thing that's interesting about these is that these are like accessibility 101 errors. <laughs> these are the things that WebM we've been talking about for over 20 years. They're all readily detectable. I mean, our, our tool can readily detect these. And most of these are pretty easy to fix. So if we think about how we can start to make a difference, this is, this is the place to start, these foundational aspects of accessibility. Um, each of these categories saw improvements over the last year. That number came down a little bit in all of these categories, with the exception of empty buttons, which I think may align with the increase in complexity. We're getting more and more frameworks and libraries that are creating buttons that do not convey useful uh, descriptions or text. I think most powerful from these data is that 96% of all of the errors that we detected, of those 50 some odd million errors, 96% of them fell into those six categories. So if all that we did is address those few types of issues, we would significantly improve accessibility across the web. Um, just um, millions and millions of detectable errors, barriers for users with disabilities could be very quickly addressed just by all we did as an accessibility field is focus on those six things. So I think that's a great place to start. Um, 
you know, we, in the accessibility field, we, I think we do spend a lot of time on like web components and ARIA and these complex things, and they're important, sure. And they do pose barriers to users with disabilities. But the, num the, the numbers and types of those barriers, I think, I, I, I shouldn't maybe label them as insignificant because they're significant for a user that's experiencing those barriers. But if we just looked at the vast numbers, um, that's not where the, where the real impact is happening. But those things tend to take most of our bandwidth and effort when we're talking about and debating accessibility and uh, when we're developing guidelines and standards and things like that. So taking a step back to the basics, I think, will certainly help us uh, be more inclusive of those with disabilities. A little bit more detail into some of the things that we found. Um, on average, there were 32 instances of low contrast text on the average homepage. So 32. Uh, this was by far the most common accessibility error uh, detected. Um, so when low contrast text was present, there tended to be a lot of it on the average homepage. Uh, over one third of images had missing or questionable or redundant alternative text. And 50% um, of the images that were missing alternative text were also linked images, which is kind of a double whammy, meaning you now have a, a link <clears throat> on an image that does not convey any information about that link. So uh, increased impact on users there. And almost half of the 4.4 million form inputs that we detected were not labeled, did not have associated label text. And you know that includes things like the label element, title, ARIA label, ARIA label by and so forth. So we have a, a robust mechanism to determine whether that accessibility is actually present. Um, and there, there's a whole lot more data. Uh, we will be publishing, or, uh, we uh, publish a report every year, so you can always go online and, and learn more about what's there, and we'll be publishing this year's report uh, in the coming weeks. Another area of interest was with ARIA, Accessible Rich Internet Applications. If you're familiar with that, 68% of homepages had some ARIA, um, which is a lot, considering that ARIA is relatively new um, you know, when, it, when it comes to the history of the web. And on average, there were 48 ARIA attributes uh, on, the, on the typical um, homepage. Of interest, though, while ARIA is intended to improve accessibility, pages that had ARIA on them um, averaged 24 more or additional detectable errors than pages without ARIA. In other words, pages that implemented uh, this accessibility technique had a lot more errors on average. Um, and the more ARIA code that was present on a page, the more detectable errors there are on those pages. Um, for instance, you know, we found that 60% of ARIA menus were not properly coded. So we see a lot of implementation ARIA of ARIA. And this isn't to suggest that the ARIA is causing the accessibility errors. We don't know that. But we do know that when ARIA is present, the pages have more detectable errors. And that's not entirely unexpected, because this is for rich internet applications. Pages that have ARIA would probably tend to be more complex, larger. Um, it maybe be more application-based than content-based, but it is <clears throat> certainly of, of interest. Um, also pages, uh, and we, we know from the data that pages that had ARIA were, were significantly larger, well over a thousand elements on the, uh, on the average page if there was any ARIA present. So I don't know if this means that ARIA is, <clears throat> ARIA is making things worse or better, I, I can't answer that. Um, but uh, I think this aligns with the fact that the web is getting a lot larger and more complex and even accessibility techniques don't always align with improved accessibility. A couple other quick uh, things that we found, 22% of pages had links with ambiguous text like click here or more or continue. And uh, when any of those were present, there were about six of those per page. So in other words, if you find one click here link, you could expect to see probably five more ambiguous links on that page. 10% uh, of pages had a skip link, uh, which is a you know, very specific accessibility technique uh, to benefit keyboard users. But uh, over 10% of those links were broken. They didn't actually work. So one out of 10 of those uh, accessibility uh, implementations did not actually provide accessibility, but perhaps the opposite. 11% uh, of home pages had no heading structures at all, and 38% of pages that did have headings uh, had skipped heading levels. Uh, one, another thing of interest, we found that pages that had valid HTML5 
doc types, which would indicate probably a newer page that at least has implemented uh, HTML5. Those pages were significantly larger, almost twice as many page elements as pages that did not have an HTML5 doc type, and they had 35% more errors than other pages. So again, that just, just provides additional um, I guess data that as the web, as we make changes to the web, as we update web pages, they get a lot larger, and we're seeing significant increases over time. As we looked at uh, site category data, so what is the nature or category of these websites? We saw very um, significant differences in errors by site category. For instance, uh, shopping pages had 46% more errors on average than um, home pages generally. Home pages for news and weather sites had 43% more errors. Travel sites had 16% more errors. Now education, which is one that you would think would hopefully um, be better than average, actually was right about average. Um, the number of errors were just just one percent lower than uh, home pages generally. Health pages were uh, six percent better and government pages nine percent better. So this is just showing the difference between uh, the detected errors and the overall sample. <clears throat> so pretty significant disparities uh, in uh, based on the, the nature or category of those sites. Um, you know, while the you know, government websites uh, were among the best, they still had 27 errors, right? Detectable errors on average on those pages. We did additional research in the last couple of years and found, uh, for instance, COVID vaccine uh, websites for getting information about the vaccine and registering for vaccines also had, had notable bar barriers. On average, 19 detectable errors across uh, the US states and territories on those pages. So um, now 19 is a whole lot better than 50, which is our average, right? And that's wonderful, right? But we still, um, there's still a lot of barriers out there, especially for critical health information that's of most impact for those with disabilities. We saw also really significant differences uh, based on document language. Russian and Chinese, for instance, uh, had 60% you know, and 55% uh, respectively more errors than the average homepage. Spanish, French, German, uh, also had more Japanese, a little bit more Dutch, and then English had fewer accessibility errors. And of most interest to me uh, is that pages that did not specify their language at all, which is a detectable error and a WCAG failure, were among the very best in our sample. <clears throat> so by not implementing that accessibility technique, it's something, you know, that these were among the very best, which um, again, I think suggests that when pages that we haven't touched in a while have a lot better accessibility than those that we muck around with, right? As soon as we update them and maybe implement something that defines the language, we're also making that page a whole lot larger and perhaps introducing additional barriers with that. We also looked at uh, technology, uh, technologies that were present on these home pages and uh, similarly saw really uh, high disparities among those. For instance, pages that had Google ads on them had 53% uh, more detectable errors than other pages, well, than, than pages generally. Now, you know, that's 27 errors more on average. Now, uh, of interest here is that the Google ads did not introduce those detectable errors. But there's something about the nature of pages that have an ad that they also have significantly more um, detectable errors. And that's kind of interesting if you think about it. I, I don't know if the nature of ads and the revenue, um, I don't know exactly what causes that, but it's, it's of interest. And as we think about what, you know, what we can do to influence accessibility, maybe there's something there, <laughs> right? About how these ads are presented, or maybe you know, Google and other ad services could maybe help with that. I don't know exactly how, maybe, you know, maybe revenue benefits in ad clicks for pages that also have better accessibility. I don't know. Um, and then there were a, a lot of other technologies. Almost every technology, meaning newer or modern technology that was present on home pages aligned with increases in accessibility errors. So again, if, when, we, when we add new stuff, um, it's usually not making accessibility better. Um, one thing I do want to highlight here is React, which is a, uh, you know, framework for usually fairly complex pages and web applications. 
Um, this is actually last year's data. I've not yet run the, this for, for 2022, but last year Re React as a framework aligned with fewer detectable errors than pages generally. And that was a significant improvement over the year before. And this, I think, is, a, is just a showcase for what can happen with good data and accessibility efforts. When React was first analyzed and we published these data, there was a, a lot of effort in the React community to fix it. And they went to town. They went to work on the, on the framework. Um, they you know, published uh, educational materials to help folks that were implementing uh, React. And over the course of a year, we saw a notable decrease in errors. It went from 64 errors on average if the page had React to 50 errors in the, in the course of one year. <clears throat> Those are the types of efforts that I think these data can, can speak to and help influence. jQuery, um, you know, while it aligned with 20% more errors than average, um, jQuery is pretty ubiquitous on the web. We found it on 62% of the home pages that we analyzed, and it corresponded to nearly half of the errors that were detected. So, um, you know, what could we do with React? Or, I'm sorry, with jQuery. It's on, you know, on the vast majority of home pages. Is there something? Now, we're not suggesting that jQuery caused these errors. <laughs> But when jQuery is present, there are more errors. And you know, if we could maybe do something in the jQuery community or with the jQuery framework to help inform, to educate, maybe enforce and improve accessibility on those pages, that's millions of errors, millions of barriers that could potentially be addressed. And there are many other uh, technologies that are reported in our online report that you can look at. Again, it's important to realize that correlation does not mean causation. <laughs> we don't know what's causing, exactly what's causing these errors. We know what the errors are, and we know other properties of these pages, but there are strong correspondences between certain technologies and properties of pages and those detectable errors. And we need to be care, care, you know, careful about spurious uh, correlations. If you've seen those, you know, for instance, this is a chart that shows a very close alignment of NVDA usage and exports from Pakistan, and the charts look almost the same. So if we you know, want to uh, influence NVDA usage, we just need to increase exports from Pakistan, right? I mean, it's, it doesn't work that way. Um, but sometimes when you look at data, it's like, oh, these things aligned. There must be something more to this. And um, I don't know exactly what will help improve accessibility, but we do need to be careful with the data. With that said, there are strong correlations that I think indicate places that we can, that we can have an impact. Um, we also need to be careful about what the data do not tell us. Um, but I think some of these things can be transformative. You know, what if we had, you know, got jQuery and WordPress, just those two single technologies to uh, better improve, enforce, test, inform about accessibility, um, that would, I, I know that would have a significant impact. You can go online and read additional information, uh, our full report. Uh, you can do a lookup of sites. This is currently last year's data. This will be up updated in the coming weeks, but you can you know, put in a website address, kind of see how it aligns with our, uh, in our million uh, page analysis, how it's uh, changed over time, the most common uh, errors that were detected and, and so forth. I do want to talk briefly, um, I should say part of this, uh, the ranking that we use, the ranking is based on detectable errors primarily. We do look at error density, which is the number of errors by page elements. The idea there is that, uh, you know, 10 errors on a very basic page probably has more impact than 10 errors on a very, you know, say Facebook or, or CNN.com or something like that. And the, the user's tolerance for errors is maybe higher on a page that has a lot of content and potentially uh, value to them. And then we also looked at potential or likely accessibility errors as one small factor in those, uh, in those rankings from one to one million. But I do want to talk briefly about the error density problem. So again, that's a number of detectable errors by number of page elements. Um, this year, the number of errors detected ranged from zero to over 68,000. That 68,000 page, ironically, was the HTML specification published by the what working group. <laughs> so, ouch, right? The actual HTML specification that should support accessibility was the very worst of uh, our one million pages, um, little, yeah, 
in telling, I think. Um, <clears throat> and that error density ranged from 0% to 99.9%. There was a, a page out there that 99.9% .9 of the page elements had a detectable error. So as an example of this, uh, if we look at Vue.js, which is a, a JavaScript framework, um, it, this is last year's data, but it had 51.1 errors on average and 879 elements, which means a 5.8% error density on average, if that technology was present. Um, I'm sorry, those were pages without Vue.js, okay? So it have a, had about a 5.8% error density. Pages with Vue.js were, had more errors, 67 errors, but a whole lot more elements, almost 1,300 elements, giving them a 5.2% error density. So when you look at this, if you look just at error density, you would say, oh wow, pages with Vue.js are much better than pages without, even though they have significantly more page errors. And that's one of the, one of the difficulties with looking at some of these data and, and trying to factor in page weight or value to users and then maybe uh, um, discounting potential barriers in those. It's a just kind of an interesting question that, that, we, that we, we are looking at and struggling with is how do you, how do you, how do we best game plan this? How do we start to attack it? And sometimes looking at error density is maybe not the best way. Okay, um, so that's the web aim million analysis. I would now want to transition and talk about some of the surveys that we've conducted at web aim. These really just arose out of our desire for data and feedback from users with disabilities. And uh, so we've now conducted nine different screen reader user surveys. We do these about every 18 months. Uh, our last one was last summer, so uh, this coming uh, fall or winter, we'll, we'll do a new one. <clears throat> We've done two surveys of users with low vision, three users, I'm sorry, three surveys of web accessibility practitioners. So that's uh, people maybe like you and I that are uh, implementing accessibility and one survey of users with motor disabilities. These surveys are really focused on web accessibility um, preferences and technologies and, and things like that. So uh, you can read all of the, the details on the WebAIM site, webaim.org slash projects, if you want to look into the actual uh, full results that are available. Um, so I want to just pull out a few uh, highlights, things to consider. Um, we do have our surveys available, for instance, our screen reader user surveys to all screen reader users. Uh, we don't limit that to those with disabilities, but we do ask them if they use a screen reader based on a disability. Um, so for instance, accessibility testers that use a screen reader are, are welcome to take our, uh, our survey even though they may not have a disability. That actually provides us some really interesting comparisons, right? To see if the preferences and, and technology usage of those that have disabilities are different from those that do not have disabilities. And any time we do see any notable disparities between those results, we do document those in our survey results. In general, there usually are not a lot of differences, but we always have that question of, you know, well, what about those without disabilities? Are those swaying, swaying the published results? And it, usually they do not, and if there is something there, we do, we do highlight that. One of the questions we asked in almost all of our surveys is about their feelings regarding accessibility of web content over the previous year, whether they thought things became more accessible, less accessible, or really no change. And for me, this is like putting my finger on the pulse of, of the community and saying, you know, how, how are we doing? Are things getting better? And uh, in our last screen reader user survey, 39% indicated that things became more accessible, 42% indicated no change, and 19% less accessible. This is an area where we have seen slightly, slowly increased um, indication that things have gotten better. That tells me that hopefully we're doing something right. Now, the fact that's only 39% thought things got better uh, tells us we have more work to do, but um, that number is increasing slowly over time. So keep up your efforts, keep doing what you're doing um, because it is making a difference. One of the big things we asked about uh, in our screen reader user survey is about the technologies that they use. What screen readers do they use? Our last survey, f about 54% of respondents indicating, indicated using JAWS as their primary screen reader. About 31% NVDA, 6.5% voiceover, and 9% others. Of, of interest, uh, narrator screen reader was less than 1% as a primary screen reader, but it was indicated as being used quite often 
just as a screen reader generally. So in other words, quite a few screen reader users use Narrator, but not as their primary screen reader, at least as, as reported. As we looked at the history of uh, primary desktop and laptop screen reader, you know, we saw, uh, we've seen over, since we first did our, our first survey in 2009, we've seen voiceover pretty much stay stable at about, you know, nine or 10% with a little decrease uh, um, over the last few years. JAWS saw a really notable decline from like you know 65% down to about 40%. Uh, during that same time, we saw notable increases in NVDA um, from like almost nothing in 2009 to about, actually surpassed, barely surpassed um, JAWS as the most common primary screen reader in 2019. But then things switched directions in the last few years and in, uh, in our last survey, JAWS uh, was indicated as having a, a fairly notable increase over other screen readers. So people always ask us about this, like, you know, are you sure that doesn't match my experience? And what about Europe? And, you know, all of these things. And our survey is available to all screen reader users. We don't target a population. It's just kind of word of mouth. Uh, things go organically. Um, you know, is this representative of all screen reader users? We can't say that but it is representative of the several thousand that respond to our survey from a global population. And that's, that's a lot better than nothing. <laughs> we hope it's useful. Um, so while we don't control that sample, um, you know, we'd love to be able to do that, to do a truly representative uh, survey and you know, find screen reader users that represent the overall population and, and see what their, what their preferences and so forth are. Um, anybody that wants to give us a million dollars, we'd be happy to make that happen. This is really difficult things to do, right, in a, in a, to have a controlled sample. Um, but hopefully these data are useful and informative. And, you know, data are what data are, right? We just report the responses from uh, our respondents. Um, a couple of things I want to note, um, just maybe that we consider in, in our efforts and inclusion efforts, are notable disparities in screen reader usage among those with disabilities and those without disabilities. Um, you know, JAWS usage, for instance, is notably higher among those that report having disabilities than those that do not. We see even bigger disparities among voiceover usage. Um, so what this shows is from our screen reader user survey, 6% of those with a disability indicated using voiceover as a primary screen reader, 19% of those without, so about three times higher. On our, on our web accessibility practitioner survey, so those are uh, people that are just implementing accessibility, about 35% indicated using voiceover as their primary screen reader. So there's a pretty, pretty notable discrepancy between uh, technology usage of those that are implementing accessibility and those that are consuming that accessibility uh, with disabilities. So I think that's just maybe a, a caution in, in our efforts just to consider, you know, are we testing and um, yeah, are we testing in the technologies that are, that are most used by those um, that we're trying to benefit those with disabilities. Um, you know, we also looked at screen reader and browser combinations. I think these are data that can help inform our testing practices. JAWS with Chrome, 33% uh, of respondents indicated that was their combination. NVDA with Chrome at 13%. This shows that Chrome really, over just the last few, you know, four or five years, has really, really increased in adoption um, among screen reader users. JAWS with Edge was 13%, NVDA with Firefox 10%, JAWS with Firefox at 5%, and then way down here at number six, at 5% was VoiceOver with Safari. Again, if 38% of practitioners are using VoiceOver and only 5% are using VoiceOver with Safari, they're, they're, you know, of our screen reader users, are, there's maybe some disparities there. But I think it's useful to know what your users are actually using in your web content. We look at mobile usage, and the short version of this is the iOS really totally dominates uh, among screen reader users. Adoption of iOS devices is significantly higher among this population than the overall population, um, which, is, which is really interesting. Although we have seen that kind of level out and, and, and even come down a little bit in the last few years as Android uh, has increased a little bit in usage. Okay, so that's a whole bunch of data. Now, what do we, what do we start to, to do with this? And maybe what are some cautions? 
you know, one is we need to be careful with um, and avoid false inferences. So, you know, false inference is something like, you know, people would prefer getting stabbed over getting shot. Therefore, people like to get stabbed, <laughs> right? Um, and we need to be careful with some of these data that just because they may indicate that's what they do or what they have doesn't mean that that's actually what they prefer. Um, you know, we need to be careful that we say, you know, screen reader users prefer A over B, therefore A is always best. That may not be the case. We also need to be careful with survey data uh, due to loss aversion. So the idea of loss aversion is that a, a person will lose more satisfaction by losing a $100 bet than they will gain by winning a $100 bet. Nobody wants to miss out on stuff, right? And, we, and we, we hurt more when we lose something than we feel better when we gain the same value of something. You know, as it turns out, humans are really, really bad at in indicating what they want, right? Because they don't want to lose out on anything. So an example, you know, this is not a question we asked in our survey, but if we did, you know, we could ask a question like this of screen reader users. Do you prefer that images in a web page be identified even if this results in redundancy? And the answer to that would probably be yes, of course. I don't want to miss out on images. Why, why would I not want that content? What if we instead ask, do you prefer that alternative text be repetitively duplicated or do you prefer that it be presented efficiently? Of course they say, oh, of course I want efficiency, right? <laughs> um, and that's just the total opposite uh, answer. Um, it's kind of the same question phrased in different ways. Um, you know, a, a classic example of this was with Walmart. They asked their, they asked their customers um, you know, what, they, what, they, what they wanted changed at Walmart. And they said, I want things to be less cluttered. If I could more easily find things, I would be spending more money. I get frustrated because I can't find things because everything's so cluttered and, and disjointed. So Walmart cleared out their aisles, reduced their inventory, cleaned up their shelves, added more organization, and they lost $2 billion. Um, just because they actually didn't spend more money. They thought they wanted, they wanted that efficiency and things cleaned up. The reality is that they then became more frustrated because they didn't have the things that they were looking for. Um, Carl Groves gave a great presentation yesterday on accessibility scoring, and he, he talked about three key questions that we can ask um, those with disabilities about, about their experience, and they're very important questions, and that is, you know, if you're not using this product, would you start? If you are using this product, would you continue using it? And if you've stopped using this product, would you come back? And those are great questions, right? I think they get to the heart of, of satisfaction, but again, users are really bad at letting you know what they actually want. What they do should drive accessibility changes uh, and guidelines, not what they say they might do or what they might want. So we have all of these data. I mean, we've got three billion data points in, in, our, in our million uh, database. So, um, you know, there's this comic, that, you know, the big boss is saying, let's solve this problem by using the big data none of us have the slightest idea what to do with. <laughs> And that's kind of, I look at all these data, I'm like, wow, what, what, do these, what do these mean? And I think we have to first recognize that um, all of the data that we have still are incomplete. And you know, if we have incomplete data, you know, there are two kinds of people in the world. Those, you know, first, those that can extrapolate from incomplete data. And that's the joke, <laughs> right? So well, what do we do, all right? We have these incomplete data, and how do we start to make meaning out of them, and more importantly, affect actual change for users? Um, I think it's useful for us to look at, at your own data, looking at your own customers, your own constituents, and collecting that data and asking, asking them what they're, what they're using, what, what they want, um, especially focusing on those with disabilities. You know, nothing's gonna be more informative to your accessibility than your users. As we look at the future, um, you know, we're gonna keep doing uh, our million analysis, trying to get more data that might be informative. We'll continue to do our surveys. Please help us with that. We'd be happy to hear the types of things that you would want to know about users and about the web generally. And we, we're looking at like defining metrics for weighting errors um, to better determine user impact. That's incredibly difficult, right? Um, what's more impactful for users, keyboard accessibility or, or alt text, right? Or, or um, cognitive accessibility. And you start to maybe favor certain disabilities and it becomes a little arbitrary. 
But if we want to affect change, knowing the things that most impact users and prioritizing them can be, can be helpful. Um, and we have a lot of data. I think there's a lot of analytics that can, is yet to be done on those, you know, looking for patterns and correlations and kind of aligning those data with maybe things that are not directly in the data itself. Does that make sense? Are certain patterns, are certain patterns of accessibility or inaccessibility, do they align with other things that are impactful for users with disabilities? I think there's a lot of potential and prospect for machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, you know, just kind of looking at what the trends are and what those errors are and the tools and frameworks and third party code that are in place and just really deeply analyzing those and maybe aligning those to that end user experience a little bit better, looking at where there are successes, right? When we look at uh, artificial intelligence, it's only as good as the models that are fed into that uh, artificial intelligence. We have millions of really bad models <laughs> for accessibility, but not all that many good models when it comes to web pages. So we need to, you know, we need good models of accessibility to help define what the, what the target is, so maybe these, these uh, machines can help us in those efforts. Um, and then, you know, I think shifting accessibility impact measures to the end user device. It, it turns out that computers are really good at knowing when people are upset, right? When there's anxiety. Uh, for instance, um, uh, they used artificial intelligence to monitor 911 calls. They found that the computers were significantly better at detecting heart failure in people that had called 911, better than the humans. Um, and so they found if they could have a computer just listen to that call and flag the 911 operator when it detected there was heart failure, that actually saved lives, right? So computers are really good at knowing when people are in distress. And, you know, is there a way that we could do that with users? There's privacy concerns, but, you know, um, when we experience frustration on the web, typically, you know, it's, we don't say, you know, I'm going to write a strongly worded letter. We don't put ourselves into a situation where we're going to get hurt again by trying to contact support and letting them know of accessibility barriers, right? We just fight through it or we leave. And if we could know when, it's, when users are experiencing those barriers um, without them having to tell us, how informative would that be about where the actual barriers are versus the reported uh, barriers. And we all address things when people complain, right? We want to, but most people aren't complaining, yet maybe experiencing frustration. Um, and if computers are that smart, maybe they could help us fix some of these things on their own. Uh, this is an interesting thing that I saw some time ago. Uh, so on GitHub, there was a bot that detected a sec security vulnerability uh, in one of the repositories. Um, it was actually a dependency for this repository. So it flagged the security um, concern. Another bot scanned the first bot's test results and then sent a pull request to the repository to fix that security uh, issue. A continuous integration bot uh, then verified that the pull request didn't break anything in that repository and implemented the fix. And then a different bot merged the pull request automatically, so integrated the fix uh, that had been, uh, had been kind of pushed or, or, or requested. And then when all of that was do done, a uh, different bot, upon seeing that the security issue had been fixed, um, celebrated by posting a Simon Cowell thumbs up GIF, right? <laughs> um, and this was all computers. It was entirely automated, happened extremely quickly. Um, but they found an issue, they knew what the impact of that issue is, they analyzed whether the fix would cause additional issues and fixed it and when they were done they all celebrated, right? Um, this is, I think, kind of the, the power um, that can happen with machines. They're not, they're not perfect, right? They're not going to fix accessibility, but they can fix maybe some accessibility. <coughs> okay. So just some final thoughts. Um, as we think about these data and um, things that are happening in accessibility, I think we need to transition from what is happening to why is it happening, right? I've, I've given you a lot of information about what is happening, but we don't know, quite know yet maybe why some of that is happening. Um, 
so you know we might know that certain we might be able to know that say certain content management systems or certain types of technologies uh, are in place with certain types of accessibility barriers and then implement very targeted education or bug fixing activities or awareness activities for the people in that community about why are these things happening so we can address them. Uh, again, React, I think, is a good model of that shift from you know, what was wrong with React to why is that happening and how can we fix it. We need to transition from things that are just descriptive of accessibility issues and more prescriptive, right? How do we fix these as opposed to just knowing uh, what is wrong. And you know, maybe the, the computer AI model of addressing some of these could, could help us with that. And a shift from detection to prevention, right? Instead of focusing on just fixing issues, we need to primarily focus on avoiding uh, new issues up the road, shifting left, right? Uh, left, correct. <laughs> um, okay. So anytime I present these data, I always end with this question. So what are you going to do about it? I know these data can sometimes be overwhelming and maybe even a little discouraging, but we are seeing progress and we, we can do more. I, I know that we can, that I can do more to, to influence accessibility. Keep up the efforts that you're doing. You are making a difference. Um, and if these data can maybe be helpful to you in your accessibility efforts, I, I hope that they might be. That'll say thank you. Um, we do, I think, have a few minutes if there are questions. I'll maybe, um, if there are questions, I'll, I'll repeat those back if you can keep them brief. Yes? Okay, so the question was, we looked at like language, we looked at like .com, .org, the top level domain, what percentage of the pages were based in the United States? Uh, we don't actually have that exact data. We can look at like .us or .k12, we would know that those are, are US based, but you know, a .com, uh, we don't have like data like, you know, the owner of the .com is based in the US. Uh, we did look at language and that can be, you know, that's not gonna tell us geography, but can be somewhat informative. So yeah, we really don't have that like where the website is based data. It's a little little difficult to, to find that, especially with say a multinational corporation. It's hard to know what that would be, so. Yeah, but I think there may be some things that can help with that. Yeah, just in front of the person that asked the last question, please. Yeah, good question. So, you know, can we use these data to um, somehow indicate like loss of workplace productivity or like revenue impacts on businesses, things like that? Um, I don't know. Uh, that, that would be an interesting exploration. I think with some additional, I, I think if we had kind of some models, right, of this website and this is maybe their usage base with those with disabilities and lost productivity, that we could start to build those correlations and then say, okay, well, across the web generally, what is the impact? We don't have that in the data that we have directly. We know these things are, are have impacts. They are resulting in lost productivity, but uh, um, quantifying that gets, gets a little bit difficult. Another question, uh, yeah, John. Yeah, so with the survey data, do we have information about uh, how many are from different regions or areas? Yes, uh, we do ask about, uh, about regions. So for instance, in our screen reader usage uh, data, we do report discrepancies in usage. You know, for instance, we know NVDA has a higher usage in Europe and Australia uh, compared to uh, other places. So yeah, we do report that. We do collect and report that and there is, um, anytime there are notable discrepancies, we do report those in our published reports. Um, it turns out that there usually is not a lot of difference uh, when it comes to geography in most of those responses. Technology usage is one where there are some differences, but generally the things that they indicate that are working, that are not working, their overall preferences um, tend to be fairly uh, geographically neutral. Yeah, thank you. Yes.
Okay, so uh, the question was, did we look in our million analysis, did we look at how fresh uh, the pages were, like how recently they'd been updated? No, um, primarily because it's pretty hard to tell. Some pages can kind of indicate how newly they were updated, but it isn't always, always accurate. Um, so it's, there's not a good way to know that. We're not actually capturing the pages. That might be something interesting, like capture the pages themselves and compare over time to see uh, how, if they are changing and how much. That isn't something we looked at. However, we do detect um, the technologies and things like doc type and code implementations that would suggest newer technologies, newer code changes. You know, for instance, React, we can, usually indicate uh, we can detect what version of React they're using. And if it's a new version, we know that site has been updated recently. And so we, I have looked a little bit at some of those, um, but it pretty much aligns with what I, what I presented, that when any time those newer technologies tend to be used, the number of errors tend to, tend to increase. But again, why? Right? Why are we seeing these things? Is it the fault of the framework, or is it the fact that these pages are just getting a whole lot bigger, right? If a new version of React is in place, that page is probably twice as large as the average homepage, which means there's twice as many things to get wrong. Um, so yeah, so we kind of have some of that, but yeah, it's hard to know exactly how fresh a, or new a web page is. Thank you. Yes, please. How do you get my slides? How do you get my slides? <laughs> Um, if you, you're welcome to contact me directly. You know, the WebAIM site, we have a contact form. That's probably the best way to get these. I have lots of charts and things in there that are a little less difficult without me providing the alternative to them directly. But yeah, I'd be happy to provide them if you'd like them. Um, I don't have my email uh, on the screen, um, but you can contact on the WebAIM site or uh, you know Twitter. It's Jared underscore W underscore Smith. Sorry for the keyboard gymnastics on your mobile device with the underscores. So Jared underscore W underscore Smith um, or Jared at WebAIM.org is also my email. J-A-R-E-D at WebAIM.org. I'd be happy to, to get you those. Any other questions? Okay, let's go in the very far back. Yeah, thank you. So the question was uh, like about the survey data and uh, disparities between desktop and laptop usage and mobile usage. We actually do ask about mobile usage um, separate. So I, what I showed was like primary desktop, laptop, uh, screen reader usage and, and data. We do also collect mobile uh, data. So we, we do ask those separately. Uh, for instance, we know voiceover is like significantly used on mobile, but not as much used on desktop. So rather than conflating those and having really weird numbers, we, we separate those out. So we do ask about that in our online reports, um, provide, provide data about mobile usage. We've also asked in the past, uh, and will continue to ask about things like, um, you know, do screen reader users, do they prefer using mobile over desktop? Would they prefer it like a native app over the experience on a website. If I want to go shopping or banking, do I, am I using the native app versus the desktop? Interestingly, that's about a 50-50 split, which is quite a bit higher than the uh, overall, overall population. So yeah, we have quite a bit of information on data and, and a whole lot more <laughs> that's available in our online reports. Thank you all, enjoy your CSUN, and uh, yeah, thank you.